Genesis is a woman of color who said enough is enough and is now bolder than ever. She tried to remain quiet, but that didn't work because no change occurred. When an estimated 15 to 26 million people participated in the 2020 Black Lives Matter protest in the United States, the unplanned timeliness of her book, Chocolate Drop in Corporate America, catapulted into the limelight, gaining great attention throughout the country. Today, Genesis shares how she is stepping outside of her comfort zone by speaking up, challenging the status quo, and refusing to let limitations placed on her keep her down. Welcome, Genesis. I'm so excited to have you here on Comfort Kills with us today. Um, very, very excited and eager to speak to you because I really um, enjoy the title of your book and um, kind of learn a little bit more about you. So why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Thank you uh, for having me. So I am a native Houstonian, first generation American. My father was from Curso and my mom is from the West Indies, so the Caribbean. I am 29 years old. I wrote my book this uh, this year. Mm -hmm. It was released in May, on May 27th. So a little bit before the whole Black Lives Matter movement. And I think with the movement that started, it mm -hmm. was a good correlation to tie into the book because more people became vocal and they wanted to share their stories on mm -hmm. how they have been slighted in either the workforce or in life as a general, as a general statement and et cetera. Uh, um, fun things that I like to do. I love to, you know, spend time with my family, my nieces and nephews, travel. Mm -hmm. I to be able to see uh, all places around the world and mm -hmm. you know experience different cultures. I think that makes mm -hmm. you, you know, more appreciative of where you live and where you come from. Whenever you're able to see other people who are going through things that may not be similar to yours, it makes you appreciate and value the things mm -hmm. that you do have and not take things for granted. Another thing I love to do is practice self-development and show people, okay, what does self-development look like? Mm -hmm. Am I practicing self-care? Am I doing the things that are helping me and building up others and et cetera? Mm -hmm. Great. Wonderful. Great start. Thank you. So in reading your things um, in your bio a little bit, I actually extrapolated a couple of little phrases that you had. So I just wanted to <laughs> read the phrases and then just ask you to elaborate a little bit more so we can kind of get to know um, what you mean by that. So okay. one of the ones I really, uh, I really enjoyed it and it really caught my attention was you wrote, I am a professional who knows what my purpose in life is. It is not to sit down, muzzle my mouth and continually let people get over me. <laughs> So with that statement, for a lot of a lot of times, like I found myself being quiet and mm -hmm. after hearing no, you're like, okay, you know, that's the that's their final answer. But then whenever you think about it, you you ask yourself, okay, what is the reason the reason behind the no? Right. And just hearing no doesn't mean that that's the final decision. No could just be a redirection to your purpose. So that's where I said it's not to remain quiet and have a muzzle on my mouth because if I never understand the reason why, then how can I move forward and be unapologetically me? Exactly, exactly. So um, can you elaborate on when those no's are? Are they in your personal life? Are they in your professional life? Is it in your academics? How is it? Where are you seeing the no's and how were you, I guess, in the right mindset to know that no doesn't mean you stop here and, and turn the other way and run, but no means to continue to push forward? A little bit in my personal life as well as my career. And since mm -hmm we're talking about the book, I would say a lot of it had to do with my career because I heard the slogan, once an admin, always an admin. Mm -hmm. Whenever I came into the company as an admin and I said, no, cause I'm not getting a degree to be an administrative assistant. I'm right. getting a degree to go into the professional role. And I felt like if I would have allowed those no's to, you know, be the end all be all, then I would still be in an administrative assistant role. But I saw myself more than an administrative assistant and I did the necessary steps to get outside of that role. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And another statement that I read off of your bio um, is it says, if you're wondering what you should do next, well, take the next step and write down all the things you are good at. 
out of those things which bring you which bring you joy, fulfillment, and you can ultimately see yourself making a change, not just in your life, but in your community and beyond. So can you elaborate a little bit about that statement? Yes. So writing things down, that's a way of, you know, keeping yourself accountable because once you write things down, you could reflect on it. And once you reflect on it, you could build on it. And then you could take the proper steps to, you know, carry that out. And so what you wrote down becomes an actionable item because you don't want to just write it down and let it be in vain. Mm -hmm. And then understanding, you know, your purpose versus your passion. Okay, your passion is something that you could do without getting paid for that can turn into your purpose because your passion should be what fuels your purpose. Like your purpose is what you replace to do here on earth and how you're going to go about doing it and et cetera. And then the other part is, you know, it's almost like, have you heard the saying, write the vision and make it plain? Mm -hmm. So if we never write down our dreams, our goals and our desires, are we really living or are we just existing? Mm. Great statement there. Yeah. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Are we really living or, or are we just existing? Um, beautiful. So tell us a little bit more about your book. You've alluded to it a couple of times. It's called Chocolate Drop in Corporate America. Please tell me where you got this title, what it's about, just without giving the whole story away, because everybody should go and purchase it if they find interest in it. But I'm sure you have a great story behind the title and, and the reason behind your, why you're writing the book. So I definitely wanted a title that, you know, represented me. Mm -hmm. So that's why I did the chocolate drop part of it. And then in corporate America, because I work in corporate America, and I have been the only chocolate drop wow. on my team for the longest. And so whenever you're the only person that looks like you on your team, you hear a lot of remarks and sly comments that are thrown at thrown at you or as people like to say, shade is being thrown and you're like, mm. okay, are they really, you know, directing that to me or okay, if they're gonna, if they're bold enough to say this, what are they saying about me when I'm not around? Right. And, and in the book, I really am fighting for minorities, like not just black and brown people, but anyone that's a minority, especially like living in America. I've seen a lot of people that I'm connected with who have to work twice as hard because they're from a foreign country mm -hmm. and people who, who don't understand their culture, they don't understand their background, they already have these preconceived judgments and notions against them. And I don't think that's right. No matter where you come from, everyone should be given a fair chance because isn't America the land of the free? Mm -hmm. We have the freedom of speech, we have, you know, the freedom to go about and do things that we're no longer in in chains, we're not in slavery, we're not in bondage. But I feel like when you get into a certain a certain group of people or a certain organization, you have like the modern day slavery where they want to bucket you. Like mm -hmm. for example, they have different ERG groups. So employee resource groups. So they have one for the Asians, they have one for the Hispanics, they have ones for the, for the blacks, ones for the Middle Eastern and et cetera. But isn't that a form of discrimination in the workplace? Because if all of us are minorities and we're all facing similar issues, shouldn't we be in a group collectively together mm -hmm. so we could talk about it? Because sure, you could talk about the issues that you're facing with yourself um, and your group of people together, but is that making the change? Because you need people who don't look like you. You need your allies to be able to understand where you're coming from and how to walk it out. Right, right. And I've seen like, you know, a lot of, you know, some of my Asian friends here who are Vietnamese, like, you know, they were just treated so bad working in a corporate sector that, you know, they ended up opening their own restaurant or owning their own donut shop and, you know, providing a way of life for themselves because, you know, they weren't given a fair chance or treatment. Wow. And I don't think that's right because they came here, you know, to work hard, mm -hmm. provide for their family and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So in my book, I said, okay, I'm going to talk about what I've endured mm -hmm. in corporate America, because this topic is very relevant to other people, whether it's from my story, but other people could relate to, you know, how they have been told no, how they have faced systemic racism how they have been slighted due to the color of their skin or, mm -hmm. you know, their cultural background or their upbringings. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're now in 2020, like the world is evolving. So we, we must evolve as, as a humanity and do better. Mm -hmm. And if we're not, we're only regressing in society instead of moving forward. 
Yes. Wow. Powerful. That was a powerful, powerful segment there. And I really appreciate that. And, and, you know, it's, it's disheartening to see that corporate America organizations, just anybody out there that has, um, it doesn't have to be fortune 500. It's anything and everything, any organizations in general, not still not understanding what diversity truly means. And I had a guest on the show last season who had a disability. She was born with dwarfism. And so the differences in what she sees and the discrimination that she feels with having her disability and not being the first to be um, hired on and not being the first to be selected and chosen because they all felt like she came with baggage and they weren't quite sure if she was ready to take it to the next level. And so I feel like skin color, same thing, you know, yeah. and, and we spoke about how diversity people preach diversity and they say that they're a diverse organization, but they don't necessarily practice it. And so the example you gave with having very different categories and silos of nationalities and diversities in those different areas is still keeping everybody separated and not providing all the resources to everybody uniformly uniformly, uniformity wise, you know, and so it, it's just, um, it's disheartening to see that it really is. And to hear that people are leaving corporate America, leaving their jobs to find another um, outlet and avenue to make money and feel appreciated and feel the worth is there, you know, their self-worth is there. And, and that's really sad. So great. Um, so what has been the, the, um, the feedback so far since you've came out with your book in, in May? So since my book came out, um, I spoke up during a vice president's meeting mm -hmm. so that was surrounded around the whole Black Lives Matter movement. A week later, I was given a 20% salary increase. So you could only imagine for the past three years in my current role, I was underpaid by 20%, which is a big pay gap and disparity. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have given good reviews on Amazon, mm -hmm. some transparent reviews, some people I knew and some people I didn't know. One guy um, informed me that my story was similar to his work story. Now he's writing his own book to share his work experience and what right. he went through and how, you know, he's taking it a step further and pursuing a lawsuit against the company. Oh, wow. Another lady, um, we met on Facebook and she really ignited with, you know, the book and she told me her story and she allowed me to come on her platform. And now she just feels, you know, so taken, taken back by it, as well as so appreciative of me sharing my story. She asked me to co-host for her time to time mm -hmm. and her platform spaced out in the Jamaica area. Uh -huh. I've been in a few magazines now which is really cool because I never even like expect it to be in a magazine. Wow. But I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm just so thankful to God for, you know, all the mm -hmm. opportunities and to have these candid conversations and, you know, the transparencies to like share my story with other people and have other people share their stories with me. Because mm -hmm. like I tell people, it doesn't matter where you come from, what industry you work for yeah. or where you want to go in life. Like, you know, our stories are our testimonies and that's what makes us unique. And that's mm -hmm. what sets us apart from everyone else. So don't be afraid to be you and don't limit yourself based on the limitations or barriers people try to place on you. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that you also wrote in your bio as well, is that um, even though you didn't feel like you had the skill set, so to speak, mm -hmm. you still had a story to tell. So I, I love that you are um, inspiring others to write their books and tell their story because, you know, that's the whole purpose behind Comfort Kills is really to just go out here, reach out to different people, find out what incredible journeys people have had and the stories they have to share so that if I can touch one life, you know, that's all I need to do with this, you know, with one episode, one life, that's all I'm asking for. I'm not asking for tens and hundreds of thousands of people to, to resonate. I just need one person to resonate, which means the message got across and it got to, across to at least one person. So one life change, that's all I'm asking for. Um, but that's what you had mentioned as well is that maybe, I'm not sure if it was internal or external perception that people didn't feel like you had the, maybe the skill set to be an author, but you felt like you had a story to share. So can you elaborate a little bit about that? Yes. So like, Whenever I considered myself writing, it was writing mainly for fun, like mm -hmm. my way of getting my thoughts out of my head onto paper. So I felt like, okay, I don't know one thing about being an author. And then I felt like pe other people who were authors were like, okay, 
you're just trying to cross over. Do you know what this is? Do you know what copyright is? Do you know what all this stuff? And I knew about the stuff, but I didn't have, you know, the full credentials, but that doesn't mean that I'm not capable to walk into that space. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, okay, whenever I would hear those negative comments, I, I just, you know, equated it to, okay, those people aren't for me. I, my job is not to convince them to be for me. It just lets me know that they're not going to be a part of my tribe because my tribe are going to be people who are better than me, people who are already walking ahead of me and people who I could share myself with and we can help one another because I feel like in life, we should be building partnerships, not competitions with people. If you see someone that's doing something great, celebrate that person. And if you're really intrigued, ask them to be an informal mentor or a formal mentor so you can learn together because, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have it all figured out. And 99.9% .9 is you don't have it all figured out either. But if we could share, you know, our differences, if we could share our successes and we could, you know, learn from one another, then we could go further together. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I felt like that was important. Great, great. So what um, advice or what resources would you redirect somebody to if they came to you and said, Genesis, I am very inspired by your story. I have my own story that I would like to share with the world. Where do I start? What, what do you tell them? So I would tell them to either write a paragraph or a page a day and make sure they're capturing their thoughts, whether they're using, you know, old school pen and paper, or if they want to do it electronically and put it in their notes on their phone or on their laptop. And what I think some people don't know is I wrote my entire book on my cell phone because I did not even own a laptop at the time, wow. but I didn't let that limitation stop me from getting my story out. So I want to encourage people that anything is possible as long as you have a dream and you believe it. Uh -huh. then it's attainable. I also want to encourage them is to tune out the negativity because there's a lot of negativity that could be around you as well as society and you don't want that to distract you from the journey that you're supposed to be walking on walking towards and going and life is a roller coaster there's going to be ups and downs you're going to be pulled from the left to the right but that doesn't mean you can't you know get in realignment and recalibrate yourself so the, life is always about finding a balance and that equilibrium but you have to really practice self-care and self-awareness to you know be in one with yourself so you can be complete and whole because mm -hmm. if you're not complete and whole how can you you know be valuable to someone else right yeah wow 100% uh, taking care of yourself first so that you can be valuable to somebody else. Because if you're not 100% there, how can you give yourself to someone else? Yeah. So great, great. Um, excellent information. So what specific roadblocks? Um, I know we touched on it a little bit before, but I'm sure there, there's still more yet to, to share. As a colored woman in corporate America, as a colored woman in this world, in this day and age, even in 2020, you mentioned it, even 2020, we're still having issues. So what are some of the, the issues and concerns that you've had even prior to the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, what are some of the things that you encountered personally or have witnessed that um, you just hope to see eventually see a change in that? Pay disparity amongst um, minorities. Mm -hmm. I've also seen systemic racism in the workplace as well as outside the workplace, like a lot of interracial couples they get looked at weird or you know people don't really celebrate it and I feel like if you're not dating that person or you're not married to that person what is that concern of yours mm -hmm. and sometimes I feel like it's we need to stay in our own lanes and mind our own business if you don't have anything positive to add then just don't be you know don't be adding fuel to the fire another thing that I wish to see different is the ability for inclusivity and diversity to really be you know evident in the workplace because mm -hmm. I feel like they're just saying the buzzwords so they could check the box and look good to yes. their shareholders but if you're not you know if you're not promoting your minorities as fast enough as your Caucasians are you really inclusive and diverse mm -hmm. if you're not you know, looking at people, like you said, with dwarfism or p people who are the LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. people who are, you know, dealing with any, any disability, you know, if you're not treating them fairly, like you're treating someone with no, no physical or evident disability, can you really say that you're inclusive and diverse? Mm -hmm. And I feel like 
Another thing is like mothers, like some jobs don't even have a mother's room for the mothers to, you know, you know, pump their, Mm -hmm. pump their breast milk. They don't have a room for the mothers to store their milk or anything. So how can you really be inclusive and diverse if you're not catering to the working mom population? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. And I think sometimes the males don't under, understand because, you know, sometimes the women in their lives are so busy doing everything. And if you say, okay, I need to, you know, go do this or that. And they're like, oh, like, why do you have to do it? And you're like, well, you know, you shouldn't really have to explain yourself. They should be understanding. Mm-hmm. So there is a lot of uh, things that I would like to see change in the workplace as well as society in general. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to take more people who are bold and who are speaking up about it for that change, you know, to be made. And there is a way that you could challenge the status quo and do it professionally and respectfully without anyone getting, you know, their feelings hurt. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. Like you hit everything right on the nail. It's just mind blowing how, the example of interracial couples and, you know, what's it to you if there's an interracial marriage or they have interracial children? Why is that such a problem for you? Like they're not doing anything. They're not hurting anyone. They're not, you know, creating crimes. They're not, you know, murdering people. They're not doing anything. They're not hurting children. They're not doing anything, but they're a a couple in love who decided to start a family. And it is just, it's mind blowing how people can be so offended and can be so negative still um, in this day and age and 100%. And and then also in the workplace, breastfeeding, having, having breast pump rooms, having those rooms for the lactating moms to be able to know that they can step aside and privately be able to do this and have a wash station. I've been very fortunate working in healthcare that we have always been really on top of that. I've worked in pediatrics. And so we're very, very um, open to that. And we make sure that we have availability as much as we can. And if like a specific department doesn't have it, then we make sure that we have accommodations so that the other department they're sharing with has double the supplies. And so there's always, we're always very accommodating in that sense. Um, And I forget that in my safe little worlds of healthcare, where I do feel like it's much more open-minded and they do accommodate these things that in other aspects of the in other industries, that's not so much the case. And that's just, especially in corporate America where it's, where it's male dominated and um, they just don't understand from a female's perspective, the things that need to, to be in place. So, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you so much for resonating it. It's like the small little things that make a difference. Like you're not asking for these big old accolades, but if you could just meet us halfway, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's, um, I had, so the guest that I had on, um, Becky, she had mentioned with the dwarfism, she had mentioned, you know, don't just say, and don't just have on paper and in writing that you are inclusive and you're diverse and that you promote, um, that you're, you're very, um, non-discriminating against disabilities, LGBTQIA, race, um, all of those factors, don't just say it on paper, but actually do it, you know, and, and one of her things is, you know, don't, don't be afraid to ask me, tell me, you know, if you're, if you're not quite sure what my, um, my needs are, come and ask me, you know, as a leader, come and ask me what I, what you can do differently to help accommodate me. Not that I'm expecting it, but at least make it an option for me to say, oh, well, if this and this was done differently, it'll be a little bit better for me, you know, and just kind of find ways to accommodate different groups of people and individuals, you know, whether it's a unisex bathroom or a breast pump station or any of the above there, there's so many things that I think employers and organizations still need to consider and look at instead of just writing it on a piece of paper and say, yep, we checked off the the boxes, check, check, check. But are you really doing it? Are you really showing the efforts in your areas? So, um, so Genesis, the, you mentioned Black Lives Matter and the movement that occurred after the release of your book. Tell me how that has changed the trajectory of where you had originally intended to go with it or how it's amplified it. I definitely think it has amplified it because more people after the whole Black Lives Matter movement, I feel like 
you know, people have became more radical and they're more open to talking about it because it has now been like, you know, a buzz phrase, a buzz group and a collect collection of different activities that have transpired, some good and some bad, because like I, I'm not for the looting or the burning down buildings or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I am for, you know, hearing why they say Black Lives Matter and saying Black Lives Matter is not, you know, a racial term where we're saying all lives don't matter. Yes, all lives matter. But whenever you see your kind getting gunned down or killed for no apparent reason, then that becomes a problem because, you know, that could very well be your son, your daughter, your brother, your cousin, your uncle, your mom, your dad, or anything like that. And for, you know, hearing about the Breonna Taylors, the George Floyds and all, and the long list of names, like if that doesn't make you, you know, think differently, then where's, where's your compassion? Where's your empathy? Like, mm -hmm. How are you adding your human, your human ability to humanity? And I feel like in humanity, we have taken out the human instincts part of it because it seems like everyone is at war against each other, fighting for turf, fighting for names, mm -hmm. looking for branding and et cetera. But we have to really get to the root of the problem. So I think by, you know, the people who are really going out there and speaking up against, okay, why Black Lives Matter, what we're doing to change it, it is helping give, you know, Black and Brown people like myself a voice too, because we're able to share our stories, because now they see that, okay, it is a problem. But just because we're having this movement now doesn't mean it wasn't a problem. It has always been a problem, mm -hmm. but it just took someone dying on national TV for you guys to heighten and increase the awareness. But what if he never died on national TV? Would you still say Black Lives Matter? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Genesis, if somebody is a supporter or would like to begin supporting and cannot relate, they are not, they are from of, of, of different skin color. What is the best advice you have for them? If they would like to, to now be more involved or what, what is it they can do to support the Black Lives Matter movement? I would definitely say educate themselves, whether it's reading a book, whether it's, you know, building a partnership or a friendship with someone who is African American and asking them, can you tell me a little bit about your stories or some of the things that you have, you know, witnessed or encounter? And mm -hmm. is there anything I can do to change it? Like ask, questions are made to ask and no questions are dumb. But I feel like if you really have that sincere and genuine, you know, conversation and you want, you want to have that open dialogue, people will be receptive mm -hmm. to, you know, share their stories, but don't just make assumptions. And I feel like a lot of times people make assumptions and that's not good because that's not getting us anywhere. And I would definitely tell people, people like you know surround yourself or travel to places that you know are predominantly african-american and try to submerge yourself in you know that environment and see if you could survive or see if you could you know understand a little bit more about why they do what they do because like here in Houston, Texas, there are some, you know, urban black neighborhoods that, you know, the streets need fixing. They have potholes in the road. Public transportation doesn't go from like, you know, the hood part of Houston mm -hmm. to like the really nice part because the nice areas like the Woodlands and, you know, Conroe and River Oaks, they don't want public transportation running through because they feel like it's going to devalue their community or it's going to bring riffraff in. But why should you name you know, the people riffraff, just because they're a product of that environment does not mean that environment is inside of them. Maybe mm -hmm. they don't have the necessary funds or means to get out of the community. Mm -hmm. Another thing is, if you really want to help, why don't you contribute to some HBCUs, which are historically Black colleges, to afford African American people the ability to go to college if their parents aren't able, you know, to fund their education. Because we all need education. We all want to improve and become better and, you know, contribute back to society. But if they're not given a fair chance or opportunity to do that, then they're becoming part of the statistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's many different ways that we can go about, you know, creating change. We just have to look for those opportunities. And you really have to, you know, do a heart check and say, is this something I'm fine with? And if not, how can I become part of the solution versus the problem? Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. 100% being the solution and not the problem, asking questions and just figuring out what it is they can do within their circle of friends and peers to help. So, and then immersing themselves. I love that immersing themselves. I would have never thought to immerse myself in another culture in another country, but you're right. Maybe that does um, speak to the reason why certain people, um, their behavior is a little different or they speak differently or they address you differently. And, and I've noticed that just working in the healthcare industry, having so many different people come in from um, all over the world for treatment at our hospital and, and the hospitals that I've worked at and just knowing that, you know, culturally, the way they speak to one another is differently, you know, different, you know, in some cultures, women aren't allowed to speak to the male um, individuals. And so we could not have male nurses take care of certain patients as well. So just being very cognizant and open to different cultures and understanding, maybe you don't understand the diversity, but asking questions and understanding that a little bit more and go, okay, now if I, in my case, if we have a patient from a different type of culture, or they practice a different religion, I always like to do my research and understand a little bit more about it before I start asking questions. So I have like a concrete like base knowledge of of how to proceed with the types of questions so I'm not asking questions that are just ignorant you know and I'm asking very relevant questions so that I can understand more so for sure 100 percent um so what are the next steps for you as an author you've you've released this book do you have plans to expand to have a version two or to do something slightly different I definitely want to add a version two where I talk about how I did get the 20% salary increase and, Mm -hmm. you know, how, you know, I found out the news a week, like a week after my father passed away in November that I was being laid off after seven and a half years. And I feel like that is still part of my story and, you know, my journey with the book that needs to be told because you know, even though I was going through, you know, two losses, the loss of my father, and now the loss of my job, um, that could really beat somebody down. But um, I didn't allow that to, you know, affect me. I just looked at it, okay, God, you have something better in store for me. Mm -hmm. When one door closes, another one always opens, and it may be bigger and better. But you have to be grateful of the time that you did have where you where you were, because you gained knowledge, you gained experience, you made friends, you learned, you grew, Mm -hmm. and etc. And I felt like that should be in a version two of the book. Mm -hmm. And I definitely want to, you know, take this book into the education system, where I could teach young kids about inclusion and diversity and what it looks like, because they're at an age where, you know, their mind is open, and they're eager to learn, and they're not swayed by peer pressure, or they're not swayed by, you know, what the world system is. Is, but they're at a young age where they could really absorb everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So let's back it up a little bit. I am very curious and you can only, you can go into as much detail or as little as you'd like, because I, I am not sure what your um, circumstances are, but I heard 20% raise. I heard layoff. What happened first? Is that this all the same place, the, all the same employer or? Yes. So the 20% salary increase came a little after the whole Black Lives Matter movement. The layoff was announced a week or two ago Mm -hmm. um, when my job announced that they were cutting 1,900 jobs. And my my supervisor pretty much told me, hey, your your skill sets, like, you know, aren't aren't going to be transferable with the company or anything like that. And I was like, well, that's so weird because, you know, I have a supply chain degree. I work in the supply chain organization. You know, I can do administrative stuff because I was an administrative assistant. And, you know, I also have a little bit of procurement background from my one of my previous roles. So I don't understand how those skills aren't transferable throughout a big fortune 500 oil and gas company. But I was like, you know, whenever I sat back and I let it marinate, I was like, well, you know, seven is the number of completion and it will be seven and a half years once I separate from the company coming this February. And so instead of being salty about it, I was like, okay, what, what have I gained within those seven and a half years? I've gained Mm -hmm. friendships. I've gained knowledge. I've gained experience. You know, I gained having a good company now to put on my resume, like a big company that's, you know, branded. And I was like, okay, these are all wins. And these Mm -hmm. are things that I could take with me. And I was like, but it does suck that, you know, someone tells you that, okay, your skills aren't transferable. And then what other, Another thing that sucks, okay, you're you're talking about this whole Black Lives Matter and how you want to promote African-American 
people, but then I'm the only African American person on my team and the only one getting let go. So, okay. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I see how it all, all the dots connect now. That's insane. That's insane, Genesis. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that you had such a, I don't know, a sucky leader. <laughs> I don't even know how else to say that. You know, as, as a leader, if I, you know, cause we, my organization or the organizations I've worked with have been through, you know, the layoffs and this and that. And so we've been through our roller coasters and stuff too in healthcare. And right now more than ever COVID-19, when you think it's supposed to help you know, and we're supposed to be thriving. I work in pediatrics. We're not thriving. You know, people are afraid to bring their kids to the hospital, even though it's the safest place to be because we are cleaning like crazy. Um, and we are, we have all the protocols in place. However, you know, it's still just the, the irony of it being a global pandemic, but yet in pediatric healthcare, we are suffering because everybody's afraid to bring their kids in. Kids are not really affected by this. We have, um, we have some patients that come through, but not a whole lot. You know, it's not like the adult world where people are just, it's people are overwhelmed in certain areas of the country. Um, but for your leader to say that your skill set is not transferable, like as I'm hearing you, procurement, sales, administrative assistant, I'm like, come to healthcare, girlfriend. Like we have so many, we have so much needs in the supply area. Um, my supply area, come to Miami. Like there's so much available <laughs> to you. Any organization has to deal with supply and procurement, no matter what type of organization it is, Fortune 500 or not. It, you know, it, there's, it's just, I, I feel like, why, why are we going to say, okay, we have to let you go. And then on top of that, yeah, you're not going to do so great out there with what you did here. I, I think that's just terrible. That's terrible, like way to, there's no encouragement there. There's no, that's just all doom and gloom. And that's just not nice because it's not even true. That's the thing. Like, I feel like it's su such a huge lie that, that he like said to you or he or she could be, she had said to you that, um, I, I don't feel like that was fair. I'm so sorry for that. Yeah. Thank you. At first I was salty about it, but I was like, how can my skills not be transferable in this company? Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what, you can, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make the horse drink. So I was like, you know, it's, it's been a good run, but I'm looking forward to new opportunities that are out there. And I'm actually, you know, weighing my options about the healthcare industry. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I, I feel like in healthcare, I mean, we're, especially now with the, um, the shortage of supply. I mean, it's probably not a great time to start because it's overwhelming, but I feel like we, there's always a need. I, I, I personally think there's always a need. I might be um, ignorant to what they do on the supply side because it's not my department and it's not a direct effect to me other than my patients need supply and my staff needs the supplies to you know care for the patients. But we've always had openings in our supply. So I don't know <laughs> if it's Miami or, but I definitely feel like there's opportunity. So keep your, 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 your horizon open because I definitely feel like there's tons of opportunities for you. And the skill set is very important because any organization you go to, there's always going to be that, you know, it's not like medical billing or coding or anything like that, where that has to specifically be in healthcare, or it's not, you know, and I feel like if you're in the type of company that you worked for and the type of job that you've done, you know, lean methodology, you know how to do all those Six Sigma things. And so, girl, you have <laughs> such incredible skill set. Like I'm not even worried about you, but it just bothers me that somebody would say something to an employee like that. And so, wow. Uh, okay. So let's, let's shift a little bit. Let's have a little moment here. Um, but I know that you mentioned um, religion a lot. So tell me how that has shaped you into the woman that you are now and the author that you are now. Yeah, so my parents uh, were both from religious background. My dad grew up Catholic, my mom Anglican, and then me, um, mainly non-denominational, but my faith is what really kept me grounded, knowing that there was a higher power and a higher calling and that, you know, I was created for a purpose. And, you know, there's a quote I like to say, faith without works is dead, and it's also biblical based. And so if they say, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, which 
a mustard seed is so tiny, then you can move mountains. So all you need to have is like a tiny little faith. And if you have that, imagine you moving a big old mountain, but imagine if you keep increasing your faith, like what more can you, you know, accomplish and get done? And so I let that really, you know, keep me focused, even on the days where, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do, or the days where I felt like giving up, I knew that, you know, I couldn't, and I kept on going because, you know, it was going to, you know, make my parents proud. It was going to make, you know, those younger um, girls and boys that were looking up to me, you know, it was going to increase and strengthen them too. So I felt like I have to, you know, allow my fate to help me walk out this journey. But then I also have to do myself a service to help other people. And, you know, that's part of who I am Mm -hmm. and it's part of my wiring. So. Okay. Great. All right, Genesis. So if you had a billboard, what would it say? Uh, I love the Babe Ruth quote. So never let the fear of striking out, keep you from playing the game. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Are you a ball player? No, but it just really (laughs) stuck to me. And I got it from, you know, the movie, a Cinderella story Uh because her stepsisters were so mean and nasty to her, but, you know, whenever her dad wrote that quote down and it said, never let the fear of striking out, Mm -hmm. keep you from playing the game. If you allow fear, which is a mindset to grip you, then you won't able be able to play the game and, you know, show up and make those home runs. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the, the preface behind, you know, comfort kills is like, being comfortable, being complacent, having fear of what the unknown is, is what's going to keep somebody complacent and you're never going to move forward. You might a little bit here and there, but you won't catapult forward like you potentially can. So 100%, I love the quote. Um, All right. So sometimes we don't know what we don't know. Um, What should I ask you that I have not asked already? Mm. Oh, that's a good thing. When, oh, when did you know it was time to step outside of your comfort zone? And did you know, or were you forced to step outside of your comfort zone? Okay. Okay. Am I asking you or are you asking me? <laughs> you can do a two part. Cause I'm interested to hear okay. how you started your podcast and et cetera too. Okay. So this is my quarantine baby. Um, I've always wanted to do something to this effect. My cousin and I speak about it a lot. She's huge on mindset coaches and just those who are out there and they're like, they're very loud and robust and they have a lot to say. And they just like, you listen for five minutes and you're pumped, you know? And so that's the type of stuff that she likes to listen to. So we share back and forth a lot of quotes. That's like just great mindset quotes. Like, oh, here, save this one. Oh, here, this one's so you. Oh, here, this one I found for, that's like perfect for me today, or it's perfect of how I feel today. And so we just kind of had this back and forth. And, and then we just mentioned, like she mentioned to me, she was like, this would be really great for you to just put it out there into the world. And so I started thinking, I was like, you know what? There's a lot of, a lot of things and stories out there to share. And, um, and that's how I started my podcast journey. It's just like, okay, well, let's start. My first couple of episodes were 10, 15 minutes of me just babbling about whatever. You know, I picked a topic and I just spoke about it and it did pretty well. But then I really wanted to have guests on because it's not all about me. I really don't have, I mean, I have a fun life, I think, you know, a fun story <laughs> to tell, but it's it's not, you know, my story to share over and over and over. I, I can't, I can only beat a dead horse for so, so long, but I felt like everybody else had inspiring stories to share just so that I can hear it. It makes me feel good. And um, I've, you know, always listened to podcasts and watch YouTubes. And I always thought that, you know, I can do better than this host here, or I compare myself and I'm like, I feel like I can do way better, you know, like it'd be more engaging and entertaining. So why not? So that's why I went ahead and did it. Yep. Oh, cool. Yeah. And what about you? So the, I guess the part that really pushed me outside of my comfort zone was hearing other people's stories and them confiding in me or sharing their stories, but then they weren't brave enough to speak up about it in corporate America because they were afraid, okay, maybe I'll lose my job Mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe they'll lower my ranking because where I work, we have forced ranking. So the OCAs, which are the office clerical administration, administrative bucket we have our own and then the MPTs which are managerial professional and technical they have their own ranking 
And me being in the OCA bucket at the time, it's like, okay, you really don't get a career path or you don't really have any succession planning, like as if you, if you were in the MP, MPT bucket where those are your engineers, your geoscientists and all of that. And, you know, they know, okay, th this is what you need to do to reach the next level. These are the jobs that you're able to apply for and all of that stuff. And I was like, why do we keep talking amongst ourselves? Like, if we can all come together and, you know, target this against management, it's going to make a change. But if we keep talking about it and we're not, you know, sharing it with the right people, we're not going to make a change or we're not going, you know, to move up out of these roles. But they were so afraid. And I was like, why are you allowing them to dictate so much of your life? Because we spend right. the majority of our days at work. So, you know, we should be comfortable you know, where we were. And then the breaking point was like, whenever I started to get in the, in the headspace that became so negative where I was just pulling up in the parking garage at work, I was rolling my eyes. I was like, oh, I really don't want to be here. I have to go to the dungeon or I would say the compound. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I didn't like, you know, that part of me. It was just nasty and it wasn't God's best for me. So I was like, no, I have to snap out of this. A change needs to come and it's time to do better. When you know better, you do better. Right. And that's what, you know, pushed me outside of my comfort zone and me to just run unapologetically. Yeah. I love it. Unapologetically, unapologetically you. <laughs> so I, 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 and I appreciate that because I feel like there's so many people out there who have such an incredible story to share that, um, and they're afraid to, because A, they don't feel like they're qualified, which was something we touched on earlier. They don't feel like they're the right person to write that story because they don't know how, they don't feel like they're qualified. They don't have, I don't know, the penmanship for it or, or the vocabulary for it. Um, and then the other one was just, they feel like their story is nothing. You know, but but I feel like what you were saying earlier, you have a story, you should share it. We should all come together and, and share our stories. And women who have trauma, um, others who have suffered grief, anything that that one person, just one person out there can relate to, it's worth the time. And so 100%, thank you so much for saying that because I think a lot of people need to hear that message is that, you know, it's, you have a story to share. Don't, don't um, dismiss yourself as not having a good enough story or not having a strong enough voice because whatever it is, start putting pen to paper, like you were saying, one page at a time, do it on your phone if you have to uh, and make it happen because there's, there's something out there. Somebody's going to be able to relate to it. So that's incredible. I think another point to scare people silly, um, I said this on another <laughs> podcast, is whenever you go to the cemetery or the graveyard, you see all those tombstones, you see people writing great things on the plaques, but have you ever wondered how many dreams are, you know, lying there because that person was mm -hmm. never willing to step outside of their comfort zone to allow comfort to kill them mm -hmm. and etc and you know just walk into their glorious gifts and talents so I tell people there's so many dreams in the graveyard do you want your dream to be one that ends up in the graveyard mm -hmm. or are you going to you know exercise your rights and establish your freedom mm -hmm. and you know walk into the gifts the callings and the purpose that you have yeah yeah 100%. I mean, I cannot say that enough. It's just crazy that people, you know, one of the things I like to say is what is your legacy? What are you leaving behind? You know, are you just going to be a forgotten name that 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 drifts off in the wind? Or are you going to leave something behind that your family, your children, the society, the culture around you will remember you for. And in this sense, Genesis, you have chocolate drop in corporate America. You know, I have comfort kills. This is going to be forever be out there and, and somebody is going to pick it up, whether it's two years from now or 20 years from now, somebody's going to resonate with it on a deeper level. And, and that means that what all your hard work and all those efforts put into it was well worth it. So thank you. My pleasure. Any last thoughts, Genesis? Um, how can somebody reach out to you? What is the best way for them to reach out to you? What are your social medias, your website? So I'm on Facebook as Genesis, that's G-E-N-E-S-I-S, -E -S 
Amaris, A-M-A-R-I-S, and Kemp, K-E-M-P. I have a author page under Chocolate Drop in Corporate America on Facebook. I'm reachable via email. So that's Genesis Amaris Kemp at gmail.com. I also I'm also on Instagram at Lady D as in Deborah Richardson. And you know, I just encourage people like don't be afraid to reach out because you're a person, I'm a person, I'm no better than you are, you're no better than me. And I feel like let's just have healthy dialogues and conversation and help one another reach our goals together. And like I tell people. Um, united we stand divided we fall Mm -hmm. but we definitely have to put those puzzle pieces together in order for the masterpiece to be created absolutely and so where can somebody find chocolate drop in corporate america it's available on amazon so the paperback this is what the paperback looks like is 13 Mm dollars and i have a kindle version available for two dollars and 99 cents so fairly inexpensive like i tell people the amount you pay for two cups of coffee coffee at Starbucks or, you know, a Chick-fil-A meal, because I don't want to break the bank, but I do want people to know that it is within, you know, reach. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to just zoom in on the book so you could see what the cover looks like. Despite it saying chocolate drop in corporate America, you could see where I'm painting inclusion and diversity on the book Mm -hmm. by having various people from different industry professions. And I also have a world in the background, letting people know These issues don't just happen in America, but they happen worldwide. And so don't ever think that, you know, that this book is, you know, discriminating or you can't relate to it because this book can apply to anyone, no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. And I have a reflection quote section in the book too, because I definitely think it's so important that we take time to, you know, reflect on what we read. And Mm -hmm. I hope this section inspires people to write their own reflection quotes and, you know, maybe come up with their I am statements, because Mm -hmm. if you start to recite all the things that you are about yourself, you're increasing your self-worth and your self-value, and then you're going to see yourself in a better light. Mm -hmm. And when you see yourself in a better light, you're going to start walking with boldness, confidence, and you're going to be courageous. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. I can't wait to read it. It's um, on its way here. I didn't get it in time for me to be able to read it, but I did put it in the cart and had it sent shipped over from Amazon throughout the weekend. So it should be here. I don't know if it's outside right now or maybe tomorrow, I think it's supposed to be delivered. So I'm excited to read it. Um, and, And one last thought, Genesis, before we leave is By the time we air this episode, it's going to be possibly in January or maybe even a little bit later, but I would love for you to just reach out to me and let me know where you've snagged a job and position at. Um, You don't have to give details if you don't want to, but just as many details as you'd like, because I would love at the end of this to have like a black screen and say, and say, and Genesis has secured a position at blah, 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 as yada, 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 just to prove somebody wrong. And then you can just send this link to whomever that was (laughs) so that they can see because I am all about making sure that, you know, we get the message back to them. So, (laughs) so let me know um, if, you know, hopefully you'll be able to find a great position. That's a good match for you. And, you know, has the same, um, has the same beliefs and, 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 and beliefs as you do really. So hopefully all will pan out. I'm hoping so. I I really see that you have a great energy and I think you're going to be amazing wherever it is that you end up next. Um, And I'm looking forward to reading your book and then seeing and hearing from you um, regarding your second one. So whenever that happens. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Genesis. It's been such a pleasure having you on the show today. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you.